Okay, great. Hello, guys. My name is Rich Hansen, and um, I have uh, been teaching driver ed since 1996, I think it was, when I realized I look at the broad future and I say, whoa, 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 I got two daughters. They're going to go to college, and uh, they can't earn enough money to go to college. And so um, it's, uh, it's a great opportunity to uh, make some money. So I, I signed up for the training and all that sort of stuff and, and uh, became a driver education teacher. Um, about 2001, uh, I ended up uh, becoming uh, in, uh, meeting a guy named John Harvey. Now, some of you may know John Harvey. He um, he he was the guy that uh, invited me to be a part of um, a part of the uh, teacher training corps at Western Oregon University, and I started training teachers. And I've been training teachers up until just like 2019 when I had some health issues and I said, okay, it's time for me to take a step back. But um, I still have a, a boatload of information that really makes for a great opportunity to, to share um, with, my, um, with my friends. And, um, and so I'm looking forward to um, just that opportunity to spend time with you guys. Uh, I, I really don't need to do my presentation because Audra did hers and covered everything. And, um, and so it's, uh, it's pretty amazing the information she laid out for you guys, but there's kind of a, a, a reason for that. So I think what would be really good is if I just jumped into this thing and, and started, uh, started my slideshow. Okay, let's see if it'll come up. Okay, can you all see, I need to share my screen. That would be a really good thing, wouldn't it? Uh, hold on a second. It's been a little while since I've done a Zoom conference, but not uh, not too bad. Okay, Rich, share screen, there we go. Um, okay, so now we'll start over. And, and the title of my presentation was, um, Your Liability Portfolio, Essentials to Covering Your Assets. Uh, you know, there's a little tongue in cheek when I put that together, but the whole point being that, um, it, it really is important for us to take a look at all the things that are around us and say, you know what, in one swift moment or one error on my part, I could be in jeopardy of losing some of these assets. And, and you know what, we don't wanna, we don't wanna do that. Uh, we wanna make sure that when we're doing our, our job, it's, it's, uh, it's free of trouble, free of issues, free of liability, exposure, and that sort of stuff. And so today, we're going to spend some time looking at it, okay? So I want to talk about driver ed perspectives for just a moment. And some of us who are way down in the trenches, and all we're doing is we're just driving the cars with kids, or we're teaching classroom with them, and that sort of stuff, we kind of have a view um, that's really pretty um, low level in the sense that we, um, we don't anticipate much anything above us here. So there's a, there's a guy now by the name of Istvan Banye. I love this guy. My grandkids love this book. I open this book up and I encourage you to buy a copy. This, this is pretty amazing. And anyway, um, what it does is it kind of starts taking a look at things. And if you look at this picture and you identify it, you kind of go, okay, I'm going to back up just a little bit. Oh, wait, it's a rooster. You know, and that was the comb of the rooster. And so now we start paying attention to all the different little details that are part of the, the rooster. You know, it's waddle, it's comb. Um, oh, don't go back. That's not good. Um, and, you know, the color of its feathers, its hackles and so on, that all looks pretty good, you know. But then if we take a little bit step further back, we can see a little more detail of the things that we have to do and um, things that we... Um, are, are important to us, but let's just keep backing up here a little bit. All of a sudden, you can kind of see this is a big barnyard picture. It gets even a little bit bigger. And, um, and then we get out to the point where we take a look at what Audra just shared with you guys, and she's at 20,000 feet. She's looking at all the different things that are going on in the barnyard, including the rooster, you know, but she's also looking at all of the different things she just laid out for you guys an opportunity to really see uh, kind of what's going on at the administrative state level, 
that she's responsible for and she's responsible for in communicating with you guys. That original picture was right here. Here's the kids. They're in the building taking a look at the rooster. And Audra's out here saying, well, I've got this program in Provo. I've got this program in, um, you know, in Salt Lake City. I got this program over here. I got to deal with all of these kinds of things. And I think some of the times we get a little irritated as driver education providers. And we say, I don't want to have to deal with this. I just want to do my job. And that is to be like the two kids in the window looking at the rooster saying, all right, I got to do this drive with this group of kids, et cetera. So that's kind of the perspective. And, and you really take a look at it and say, you need to appreciate the great job that Audra is doing for you guys, uh, providing opportunities, reimbursement. She's just asking that you take care of your paperwork and, your, um, and all that sort of stuff that protects you and protects the state of Utah against any issues that might come up. Okay, so um, I have a feeling this is gonna keep running out. Oh, there we go. So today's objectives, we're gonna take a look at what is liability um, and, and what is a liability portfolio? Um, and why do I need one? And what is feasance? And, and how does that um, play into what I'm responsible to do as a driver educator? All right, everybody, I want you to type in chat. I got to open it up here. I want you to type in chat and share what you think um, liability is. Okay, let's see if I can pull up my Zoom thing here. What is liability? And let me, let me escape out of this for just a second and pull up Zoom. There we go. Let's see. And I'm trying to, it's been a little while since I've done a Zoom meeting. I'm sorry, I do some with Tim, but Tim does most of the work on it. So you'll find out about us on tomorrow. So what do you think liability is? All right, I don't know, Audra, are you still with us? There we go, that's what I need. Risk, responsibility, what I must do to accomplish, what are legal responsibilities, responsibilities for actions. Uh, what are legal responsibilities, way to protect them, limit risk, all good points. You know, those are great, those are great ideas as to what, what possibility um, that, uh, what liability is here. So let me move this here. Perfect. All right, so let's go ahead and move on. And um, I'll resume my PowerPoint. There we go, let's move that. Okay, so I like this I, I like this cartoon and I've used it a lot because there are times when it's like, okay, we want to have, um, we want to have a little prayer to kind of to protect us out there. And, um, and I will tell you, there's times where I thought about writing a country Western song that says, I found Jesus in an intersection sitting in my driver ed car. You know, there are times when my life has flashed before my eyes and um, I've had to figure out, okay, what the heck's going on and how can I, how can I get out of this? Okay. So those kinds of things kind of pop up, but that's our, that's our, um, my humble opinion about this stuff. So, so I'm going to ask you to ask yourself the following. You don't have to put it in chat. But ask yourself the following, would I be embarrassed to do this in front of a judge? So your actions, your actions are, would I be embarrassed to do this? What about two? How does well your honor sound when you're standing in front of a judge addressing the issue about something that you did or did not do that you were required to do? Okay, 
And then the other one, would I be embarrassed to see it published about in a newspaper? The, you know, the beauty about where um, I have been as I've had a very successful career in um, education and at driver education at uh, local and national level. And I don't mind having my name put in the newspaper for those kinds of things. But, you know, you read about teachers who've had that kind of shortcoming with, uh, with a student or something of that nature. And you kind of saying, I don't know, I never want my name showing up there like that. And so those are some liability issues here. Look at your spouse, look at your children, look at your home, your IV, your pension, and ask yourself if you really want to lose those. So I, these are the questions that we're going to kind of answer and say, I don't want any of this to happen. So what do I need to do to protect myself? So the first thing we're going to take a look at is um, the ID10T problem. Um, the ID10T problem is something that exists in more areas than just driver education. But if we think about it in terms of contraction, it's like, I'm an idiot. So we don't want to have any of those ID10T problems out there. And we want to function well uh, in, our, in our craft so that it, uh, it bodes well for our community, for our school, um, for the teaching staff that we work with, and so on. So here's the role of driver educator, if we can consider this. First one is, you have a performance and behavior. What can the driver do that we're working with and what a driver actually does? So the performance is, what can they do and, and um, what they actually do? So we have to take a look at what they're gonna do and say, okay, this is pretty important. I'm following along with this, okay. so. Uh, what should have been known and what could have been done. So all of this kind of comes together in our classroom and everything like that so that we can um, communicate ideas with our students in such a way that they can see um, how to do things and then what to do, how do I, what do I know about them? And then what could I have done in that situation? The role of driver educators also uh, effective learning versus trial and error. We don't just put a, car, a kid in a car and give them the keys and say, drive. That would be uh, foolish and we all know that. So we have to do pre-assessments um, that are needed and we have to have planned learning activities. Planned learning activities, I'm gonna say it over and over and over again. Those who, plan, who, those who fail to plan, plan to fail. And I know that many of you have been doing the same driving routes and the same lessons for years. And yet you may not even have a copy of your lesson plan or may not even have a copy of your route plan. And so I wanna encourage you to think in terms of what are my planned learning activities, simple to complex and, um, and procedure to process. Would you in chat, tell me what you think the most simple environment is that we teach um, our students in? And I don't wanna to go to the range, I just wanna go someplace else, okay? So go, put it in chat for me. I got one answer, backcountry roads. Any others? Neighborhoods, local neighborhoods, parking lots, a parking lot without cars, empty parking lots, neighborhoods, residential. All good. I would say, you can go ahead, that's great. Um, church parking lot, except on Sundays, not a good idea, okay? Um, Neighborhoods are good, residential is good, but there are, there are inherent risks in a neighborhood. The most simple thing that we can teach in or the most simple environment is parking lots. We need to be able to look at a place where we can practice starting and stopping. We can practice turning to the right or to the left and working on things like targeting. And, um, and I know I'm not sure if uh, AAA uses uh, uh, transition pegs or not, but the, the curriculum we do uses that. And so um, it, it's one of those things that we can practice all of those things that we normally would do. Then the next one, so we're looking at incremental changes. The next thing is to go to um, the complex and that would be like residential neighborhoods and then surface streets and then backcountry roads and then 
Um, and you just keep increasing the complexity um, as you're going along uh, with, uh, with your training. And procedure to process is real simple. Procedure, um, I used to coach, and I'm sure a lot of you are coaches, but if we take a look at procedure, uh, one of the things that we're gonna do is we're gonna take them step by step through that procedure uh, until they can actually do it. And once they get that mastered, we go on to something called process, which means they're now going to demonstrate that skill to us when we give instructions, for instance, like at the next intersection, turn left, because now we'll be able to see what they've got going on. It's, it's powerful, okay? Next one is symptom recognition. Sorry, my mouse is a little tricky today. Um, diagnose and prescribe solutions. One of the problems that we have is that, you know, when parents are working with kids, they can't diagnose the problems. Can't, they can't think of the multiple behaviors required for a precision right or left turn. And so they can't then prescribe solutions. All they can really say is, that was a nice turn, okay? Or, man, you scared the crap out of me, son. You know, those kinds of things are um, critical for them to, to um, understand how, as you as a driver educator, to be able to know your curriculum so well and the driving tasks so well that you can diagnose those problems and say, wow, so at this intersection, you didn't turn your head to target and then steer toward your target. Um, until you were halfway through the turn. And so now let's do this. At the next turn, we're gonna prescribe this solution and that is um, turning, uh, we're gonna look into the turn and you're gonna select a target and then you're gonna turn the wheel to that target. And then when you're halfway through, um, then begin correcting your, your turn. So those are uh, what happens. We try to do um, prescribing our solutions and giving them the tool to grow from there. If I, if I wanna go back, I'm gonna go back to, let me. If I continue to operate in the procedural level where I'm coaching them through every single maneuver, you better sign on for life to drive with this kid because they're gonna expect you to provide all of the information necessary um, to drive their car. You wanna move them to process and you do that by working on diagnosing their problems and prescribing solutions. And then there's guided versus unguided experience. Occasionally what happens is uh, we think in terms of, um, you know, we're just gonna go out for a drive in the country. This is what my dad always said, get in the car with mom, we're gonna go, you're gonna go for a drive with mom in the country. And my mom would say, he doesn't need practice on country roads. He needs practice in town. Well, it scared the crap out of my dad that I was driving in town. So um, he thought the best way to do it was to simply take me out on the roads and let me drive. But we have to think in terms of step-by-step, -step, procedure by procedure, um, till, until we get to process um, that allows them to have um, an opportunity to grow. All right, so if we take a look at this, those are all the things that I just listed. But if we look at it, which of those things reduces your liability? In chat, tell me which of those things reduce your liability. I like it. James says uh, all of them in proper order. That's really true. They all do. They all do. And uh, I think the biggest one is pre-assessments. We're going to talk a little bit about that in just a minute. Um, you may have heard about this case I'm going to bring up in just a minute. So um, simple to complex works at you bet. Uh, I think we just focus on the fact that we have a job to do. We're practitioners of an amazing, amazing um, educational process. I mean, you tell your friends, you're a driver ed teacher, they say, how can you ever drive with kids in cars? And it's because you know what? You've learned how to manage the risk that's involved in the driving task. So Awesome. You guys have got some great stuff here. I'm really, I, I'm glad you're listening in here. 
All right, so let's go on to the next one. Your, your liability, um, let's talk about it. Liability means legal responsibility for your acts or omissions. Wow, what that means is basically that I, my acts have, um, resp I'm responsible for my acts. And if I do them well, then there is no liability. But if I do them poorly, then those acts may very well put me in, um, in Dutch over things that I have to explain to my, my program manager, uh, my school administrator, and oh wait, maybe up to Audra and she's gonna have to say, oops, that was a problem. You know, or omissions. And, and I, I think omissions, um, sometimes we don't even think that we're leaving them out. And we need to think in terms of what are the, uh, what are the omissions that, um, that come into play? We're gonna talk about that. Now, liability has proof of negligent actions. Um, and that would be things like, oh, I don't know, things like predictability. We could have predicted that Johnny couldn't drive on the freeway since this was only his second drive. Um, and uh, so that's predictable. We can know that. Uh, reasonable response and care. We, sometimes uh, we may grab the wheel, um, and I say that kind of with tongue in cheek, but we may grab the wheel and, and turn the wheel into a problem that wasn't necessary for us to respond that way. Okay. Another one could be causation issues. Did I contribute to the issue here that caused the, um, caused the negligent action? And um, there you go. There it then there's this thing, how many have heard about torque? Just kind of put a, um, like a one in the, in the chat box. If you've heard of something called torque, it's not a chocolate cake. It's not a dessert that your mom made um, or that you made. It, it, it's a civil wrong and act of, thank you. That's perfect. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks. Um, it's a civil wrong or wrong, wrongful act. So now we combine tort and liability and becomes a civil wrong or wrongful act that um, I had a legal responsibility for my actions or omissions, whether it was intentional or accidental from which injury occurs to another. We all have liability insurance on our homes, on our apartments, on our cars. When we drive, the state requires that you probably have insurance. And if that's the case, it's to cover your liability. They can include all negligence cases, as well as intentional wrongs, which result in harm. And negligence, we're going to talk a little bit about today, probably focus more on those than um, the intentional wrongs, because I don't think we go out um, and try to do something purposefully wrong. It's not, it's not quite right. And so I hope you can kind of um, see that, okay? And feasance, you know, have you heard of something called malfeasance? Uh, put one in your um, in your pain if you've heard something called malfeasance, you know. Yeah, that's that's true. All of us are hearing about that, and we've heard about malfeasance a lot. But it carrying out our lawful obligations. That's what feasance means. So there's three types of feasance that we're going to talk about a little bit later on. But I want to talk specifically about a kid named Austin Hennifer. He was just kind of north of you in Idaho. Um, Austin Hennifer. Uh, amazing young man. He was um, just learning to drive, and um, the driver ed had driver ed teacher had two students in the car, and he the students driver the student drivers second drive. So Austin was on his second drive. Now in Idaho, I think they can start driving at fourteen, and so he was at fourteen doing his second drive. Now Austin lived in a small community that um, is pretty much rural roads. And so sometimes that's why I don't think they're necessarily our most simple um, things that are going on. So anyway, the student driver instruct was instructed to practice turnabout maneuvers. Now we all know turnabout maneuvers and turnabout maneuvers in this particular case was a turn across traffic um, into a space and backing up into the other lane of travel and then heading out the other direction. The problem was it was on an icy highway. Wait, icy highway, turnabout maneuvers, first or second drive for the kid. It was at morning dusk. So visibility was way down and that was a real problem. Limited line of sight. 
So that meant that there might have been a curve or there might have been, you know, a tree or something of that nature blocking Austin's view. The highway was a 65 mile per hour roadway. And I'm sure you all have a lot of those in Utah in places where there's a lot of wide open spaces and you got to get from point A to point B. So they've raised the speed to 65. Montana has a 70 mile an hour highways and they even have roadway signs that says slow down to 60. And I'm kind of going, what? You know, so it's pretty funny. So this is what the place looks like where the crash, where a crash occurred. This is where he was practicing, excuse me. I'm giving away the story. And um, if you take a look, he was turning into that space across the road right here. And so he was from here turning into here. And, um, and then he was backing out. Now, I, what I tried to do is I tried to alter the picture in such a way as you look at it and you kind of go, wait, that's pretty, uh, that's pretty dark and I'm losing a lot of contrast. And some car colors, and especially if they don't have headlights on, some car colors really don't stand out in this kind of low light situation. And so I think you can predict what's gonna happen. He was struck by another vehicle and in being struck by another vehicle, um, Austin was killed, teacher was injured badly, girl in the back seat injured with a fractured pelvis. So there's three, li three lives altered um, pretty much inextricably. So the family sues the, uh, uh, the Cary School District because he practiced three-point turns on an icy highway were willful and reckless. Uh, so I want you to ponder for a minute. Why do you think it would be willful and reckless? That doesn't seem that much of a problem. We practice three-point turnabouts all the time. Well, let's look a little further. Um, and uh, let's say that the jury only deliberated 90 minutes. Now there's two things that can happen when it's a 90 minute an hour and a half deliberation. One, they're gonna find him not guilty, or two, they're gonna nail him to the wall. And they found teacher Jeffrey Meacham 100% liable for causing the crash and death of Austin Hennifer. So I'm, I'm asking you to ponder here for just a minute. Here he is, he's been sued, um, and they found him 100% liable. What do you think his life is gonna be like going forward? You know? it's gonna be kind of messed up. So why did they find him liable? Number one, he didn't keep records of student progression of driving ability. I was listening to Audra just a little bit ago and she was talking about student records. And in this particular case, you're kind of required to keep a progression of student driving ability, whether it's something that's put together with your um, policy manual in your, associate, in your organization, um, or what it might be, but we have responsibility to keep track of it, okay? Um, in my school, one of the things that we do is um, we actually have a, a sheet that we have information for each previous drive that's in a folder that the driver educator who's gonna pick up that student that day um, can look over and say, okay, I see that the note from the previous instructor said they need to work on these things and um, they're making progress. This would be a good day to move forward didn't pre-assess the driver's ability to perform the maneuver in a low risk environment. We remember we called about the, the, the ability comes or the low risk environment comes in something simple like a parking lot or um, a neighborhood at that time of day is pretty, uh, pretty low risk. There are a lot of folks up that time of day. Oh my gosh, he didn't have a lesson plans, didn't have lesson plans for instruction in classroom and behind the wheel. Your lesson plan is your lifeline. It, it lays out your instructional practice and then what you intend to do in the classroom and also the behind the wheel, okay? And he didn't have a grade book or attendance records. I think Jeffrey Meacham was kind of just mailing it in, just riding in cars with kids and doing things that he'd always done because he knew that what he was supposed to do. What do you think happened to Jeffrey Meacham as a teacher? I think I would say he got fired and he will no longer, I mean, I'm, I'm sure the state revoked his license and Audra can tell me more about this, um, but uh, it, it was a problem. So here's the Idaho news. 
And the Idaho News said the jury awards the family in 90 minutes, $3.5 million in your boy's driver, in the boy's driver education debt. Oh my goodness. Now, do you think Jeffrey Meacham has that kind of money or that kind of insurance or that kind of uh, liability protection? When he was found 100% negligent in the deal, I don't think his liability would stand up. Thanks, Audra. Uh, and it uh, sounds like you spent a lot of time regarding how we train the instructors. So that's perfect. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's horrible. That's horrible. Um, so who bore the brunt? Because we know that Meacham didn't have any liability insurance. All he had was his home. And, um, and so they, they dismissed him from the case. And then they went after the school district and the school district ponied up $3.5 million. I'm gonna ask you a really, um, just a sobering question here. What would the family rather have had? They would have rather had their son back because Jeffrey Meacham did his job properly and didn't expose his son, their son, to that kind of risk that took his life. All right, so fees and some practice issues. There's laws and regulations that are in place, and that comes from the state level. And um, Audra kind of gave you a bunch of different regulations um, that are required of you as a driver education instructor. And, and she was also, I believe, speaking to the fact that um, the, the program has these responsibilities to keep records of those. So that if there's a case like a Jeffrey Meacham that comes up or Austin Hannaford, that we've got data and information that says, Your Honor, we did everything we were supposed to do. It was one of those situations that um, this, the other driver might have been speeding or didn't have their headlights on or whatever. And so we just didn't see them. Um, performance of responsibility or task. You know what? You have been trained and, and, and you have had, it sounds like, and I was listening to Audra's presentation, it sounds like you guys have had some great training, um, great training going on. And I, that just impresses me with the level of training you have and also the, um, the professional development you have. So you already have um, a level higher than most people, a higher expectation of, of success, and then the, the task that comes along with it. Performance of standard or procedure. You know, we don't go out and we don't just go willy-nilly decide to do something. There's a standard by which we operate on, and uh, oftentimes that standard's found in the curriculum that we're using, and um, how to drive looks like it's one of your curriculum or drive rights another one. Those are standardized curriculum that have, they have well long tested um, standards and procedures in there for how to do certain things. And so that's powerful. All right, what's the basis of your task or responsibility? Okay, that is, um, that's kind of the same thing. All right, uh, and this is malfeasance. Mal means something wrong, you know? And so um, it's intentionally doing something either legally or morally wrong, which had, one had no right to do. It always involves dishonesty, illegality, or knowingly exceeding your authority. It's performing illegally or wrongly. Um, in other words, maybe you allow the violation of standards with speeding or no seat belts or the person in the back seat not buckled up. All those kinds, that's a violation of the standards and that would be malfeasance. And guess who that falls directly upon? It's not something that you can avoid. If you've done that, then you have to own up to it. Uh, and then there's a minimum instruction required. Each of you is required to teach a certain amount of hours in the classroom and behind the wheel and have a certain amount of observation hours. If you sign off on that as the third one, that the student is competent with these uh, and is not able to perform that test, then what you're saying is we've done it, they're good, time to give them their license, woo. That's not, um, that's not doing um, the things that, um, that we're required to do as instructors. 
And then um, there's no eye mirror or lacking proper equipment of the DEV here call. And I believe I saw that there was uh, something about um, something about fire extinguishers and other equipment that's required in your car. If you don't have those and you intentionally don't have those, then that's called malfeasance. And you're the one that's gonna bear the brunt of that. Um, I put at the bottom of each of these slides, what are your procedures and practices? Now, I taught um, teacher training. Uh, I did teacher training for Vermont. And one of the things that I always had them do was develop a, uh, a standards and a policy manual that they can use for the program. And in it, they had to cover all of the different things that were part of the state laws and also part of their responsibility as a driver education teacher, whether it meant that they had an, uh, a mandatory teaching, uh, excuse me, a mandatory parent night, a uh, mandatory um, permit before they get to drive, et cetera. All of those things have to be in place. And in that policy manual. And I don't know how many of you have a policy manual, but I would strongly tar start thinking about in terms of what do I need to do to have policies for my association or my organization? Um, misfeasance, or excuse me, this would be, hold on, I gotta move this down. Yeah, misfeasance is a manager of re or responsibility in which there are errors and an unfortunate result through mistake or carelessness, but without your intent wasn't evil or it wasn't a violation of the law. These are some examples from Oregon. I, I don't know Utah very well, so I can't give you some of the misfeasance things that might be, but teaching to stop inside an intersection for a left turn, we can't do that because if the light turns, you have failed to obey a traffic control device. And it also, it was designed to prevent gridlocking um, allowing a student to sit too close to the airbag. You know, some students are kind of small and so um, their arms aren't very big. So you're gonna have to figure out a way to kind of back them up enough so that they're safe around the airbag. Um, and we, we have things like we're required to turn on our headlights, not just the driving lights, but headlights when the vehicle's in motion. And the reason is it increases visibility to the front and visibility to the back, because now in, in shady situations, people can see my tail lights as we're going through those things, okay? So what are your procedures and practices? What do you have for yourself? So let's think about that. And then nonfeasance. This is important for you to think in terms of, remember the kids looking at the rooster. They don't think about the things that occur behind them they're only thinking about what's going on with the rooster. You're the driver educator looking at the rooster. You're looking at your task to drive as a teacher, to teach them in a classroom as a teacher and to perform your task. But non uh, nonfeasance is where I failed as an agent to perform that task that I said or agreed to do for his or her principal employer or according to the Utah law that um, prevents me from um, tells me that I shouldn't be doing these things. So uh, this is always a classic one. You're, you know, in the summer, your drives get pretty long. The kids get thirsty and they need a bathroom stop and that sort of stuff. And so sometimes you can let them stop at a gas station um, and uh, they can go inside the, the um, they can go inside the store, buy some goodies, go to the bathroom and come out. And usually everything like that is pretty cool. But guess what? Sometimes a kid might steal something from the store and then they enter your vehicle under your control. Now, if your vehicle stopped by police because it was reported by the store owner, you're the one who is guilty of nonfeasance because you didn't follow through with the idea of not letting your kids enter the store. Uh, it used to be, and this is where Audra talked a little bit about the cars and what are they, what are they used for? The cars are used for driver education. They're not used for running errands. They're not used for stopping in the bank or fast food stores or anything like that. And so um, nonfeasance is one of those things where we have to be very, very careful that we don't violate our, our school's policies that, um, that are set in place to protect you as a driver educator um, and me as well, okay? Now there's levels of performance that we need to talk about. 
The first one is the highest level of care. There, ha there have been in the past Utah court rulings for Utah teachers. Think about this in terms of, um, I mean, it may not be directly related, related to driver um, education, but it could be related to some student or some teacher who um, exceeded the, uh, the good graces of their job with a student and um, the courts ruled against that. And they made it very plain, leave the kids alone, do your job, all right? Then there's a higher level of care. Oops, I'm sorry, I didn't change that one. Um, Utah teachers, the driver ed teacher educated far beyond that of the parents and guardian. So that means that you know more than the parents because that was your training. You in your community, believe it or not, are an expert in traffic safety education. And your job is to make sure that you exercise those kinds of skills. The standard level of care is just the general public, the parents and guardians. They're liable for their kid driving in certain situations, but um, only if they've exceeded their training or their ability to drive certain things. And then the sub one, this is, this is really important for those of you that live a long way away from a freeway. And you can't do, you can't do the driving on an expressway or something of that nature. All you've got is long straight stretches of road um, with no hope of ever getting to the freeway. And if you do, you drive one way, let's say it's 100 miles, you drive one way. Um, well, that gets burned up their, um, their 60 minutes of training. So then you turn it over to the next kid. They drive, you know, 15 minutes on a freeway. And then you turn around and the next kid drives all the way back home. So you have to apply for a, a, a waiver of those things so that you can demonstrate that you have done your very best to try and teach those particular skills. And then no standard. This is something that you're uh, going to really have a conversation with Brett uh, Robinson about the new technologies, ADAS, which is out there um, uh, and has standards yet that yet exist. We don't have any standards for autonomous braking. We don't have any standards for, um, uh, let me see, for uh, cross traffic braking. We don't have any uh, standards yet for lane departure or um, collision avoidance or any of those kinds of things that exist. The only thing we know about them are on the commercials that we see. Um, how to drive doesn't have them in there yet. And yet we know we need to teach it. I know some driver ed teachers say, oh, by golly, I can't teach this. I got to teach the kid to drive a car. And, and to a certain extent, that's correct. We still have to teach them to drive the car effectively. But at the same time, we have to incorporate some of these things so the kid's not confused when, they, when they're driving their car and it begins to vibrate and, and beep at them, um, they, they can at least know what to do. Standards, well, there's the national standard. And the national standards come with federal uniform vehicle codes. And that's, that's um, the descriptions of things like, you know, um, they now are required to have airbags and ABS brakes, et cetera. That comes from NHTSA and they lay those things out and manufacturers now have to install those kinds of things. I think some of you can remember when um, ABS braking came out, you still taught the kid to pump the brakes. And, um, and that actually defeated the purpose of ABS braking because we know that the whole purpose of that was to help us with steering. Department standards, agency regulations, and textbook and curriculum material. And you have a national curriculum with a AAA curriculum that has those uh, materials available for you. Utah has traffic and civil statutes that you need to know, and the kids need to know them. So, and we need to operate within those. Um, we know that there are certain speed limits and certain things, so we have to operate within those speed limits. Um, administrative rules, that's Audra's business, and teacher certification, that's going to be coming from the Utah Department of Education. Um, you have your model curriculum guidelines, and that's awesome that your state's operating on the same page. So all of the kids in Utah are who take driver education are going to have the same information um, delivered to them in a consistent fashion, which then allows them to um, allows them to be uh, successful on the roadway. You get your appro approved local and curriculum guide and also your state and local practices. That's, uh, that's again, that's your policy man manual. 
So standards affect all of these. And I, what I love listening to is Audra telling you how to how to get certified, how to get mentoring, how to uh, do all of these different things. And and she was throwing money at you. And I'm thinking, dang, that's a great opportunity. I think I should jump at that. You know, um, she has a very supportive department that wants to have instructor certification um, to the correct standards and also licensing standards. Did you, you, you all saw the little video of the guy and I'm, I'm telling you, I'm looking at that guy driving and I'm thinking, man, Utah kids are a lot more mature than Oregon kids. Anyway, the idea of, of um, the licensing standards, how do you, how do you check those off? Um, all of those things you're in, in, that are listed for you there. Okay. It affects these. Now, one of the things that helps with, uh, with a, a liability portfolio, and this is kind of what I was getting to, and I've got, oops, I'm running almost out of time, but it's, it's something for you to keep this information handy. So just if, if you get into an Austin Hannaford type situation, then you've got things like your certification records, your approved curriculum, okay? Your um, sample classroom lesson plans, throw one of those in there so that you've got them in a file. I have a file cabinet over here to my left um, and in it, I've got every single um, national uh, conference I've attended and I have lesson plans and I have sample lesson plans and behind the car and exemptions to my curriculum plan. We really don't have any in my neighborhood where we live because we have access to every driving environment possible. What's the local practices? That would be your policy manual. And then a list of resources used. What did you use? You guys use uh, how to drive. And I think I saw drive right there. And so, um, you know, they're powerful tools that you have to have on file. So consider having this as well. Your parent meeting, I don't know if Utah requires a parent meeting, Oregon does. We actually built it into our curriculum called the Oregon Playbook. So it's already there for the parent to go through. In vehicle guide, really important to have. It, it kind of gives you ideas on how to practice certain things in certain locations. And then, you know, having a copy of the state driver manual isn't a bad idea to have in your glove box that you can turn around if a kid in the back seat's questioning something, you can hand it to him and say, well, find it and tell us about that. And then written communication to parents and guardians. Keep a copy of that. My goodness, it's really important that you keep record of that so that when something rises up, you can kind of say, well, I sent you this on this date with this information. So, and you signed off that you had read it and your son or daughter brought it back to me, okay? Provide a guide for safe in-car practices. And, and that's, it's multitude. We've got some things, and I'm starting to get close to my deadline here. Um, we've got some, uh, some situations where the, um, oh, I'm gonna skip it. We're gonna move ahead. Policy manual, that I already explained it, uh, then, Hey, Do we Rich. Have a certified? Yes, Audra. You're you're completely fine to go up till twelve o'clock. Oh, thank you. I was beginning to panic for a moment. No, um, it, and it's fine if you go over. Oh, I'm not going to go over. These guys are hungry. They want to go to lunch. Um, evidence indicating a certified or organized pattern of practice. Oh my goodness! If we can show people this is what we've done, this is how we do it, they are not going to argue with us because they don't they don't want to lose the argument. Okay. Pre-assessment. Oh, my gosh. Austin Hannifer uh, or uh, Jeffrey Meacham was found guilty because he didn't do a pre-assessment. Talk about a pre-assessment. Um, and Paul Hardy, you just asked a question. Can we get a copy of all these things we need to have in our portfolios and in the car? Absolutely. I'm going to send, after I finish my presentation on Friday, because I'm doing this again, I will send a copy to Audra for a blast out to all the teachers from Dal Freeman and Terry Klein, um, who went, um, who produced or put together this whole thing so that uh, we can, um, we can effectively, uh, we can effectively protect ourselves from a liability. And indicating approved lesson plans, drive routes showing um, organized pattern of instruction. Uh, I used to hate drive routes because I like to just 
get in a car and go for a drive with kids. When I first started, that's kind of how we did it. We had our favorite areas that we went and we practiced curves. We practiced crossing the ferry on the river. We, we did a bunch of different things, but what we didn't have is we didn't have consistent drive routes that every single teacher took students on. And in the process, we didn't have a street location where an activity took place and the level of proficiency the student um, did in, in going through that. So showing that um, is really important. Um, permit check. I don't, I don't know how many of you um, require a permit to teach driver education, but in Oregon, they're all supposed to have it. So we have a place on the form where the instructor checks off a box and says, I did a permit check. Uh, they could even write it down, but then we've got issues with FERPA and we don't want to get that kind of information out there. Um, progress and level of competence. Wow, you've got to have information or you've got to have a form or something that, that um, indicates that for your students. And then um, your portfolio that we talked about and a student files of instruction. Um, oh, I wanna go back to student files of instruction. We have this whole file folder thing in the, um, what we call the, the driver's room, which is basically where the teachers go and the students can't. And, he, and we've got all these files lined up by drive groups and in them, we have every single drive that the student has done in order. And we have a signed form returned by the parent stuck in there so that they know what, uh, what we've done with your, their student, how well they did them and what they need to practice on. And then we can just talk about that. Um, I'm gonna, you know, you can kind of take a look at this that um, it's very, um, it's very consistent with the last things that we've talked about, okay? But protecting yourself. Novice progression of evidence, capability or evidence of incapability, injury and crash records. I wanna tell you a little bit about a crash that happened in Oregon here. And I got a panic phone call from the program manager. She called me and she said, Rich, we have a crash. I'm at the scene of the crash. And I said, well, tell me what happened. And so she, um, she described how the student um, there was a, uh, a, a joint turn, the student was here, another car was here, and she just drifted right over and hit that car. And, um, and so she said, what am I supposed to do? And I said, well, first document everything, take photographs and all that sort of stuff. I said, call, call the parents and then also call an ambulance. And the reason is ambulances don't have to transport. They can evaluate the students, they can evaluate everybody in the crash. And that further protects you from liability because now they can be the ones that release it. And the parents can ask to have them transported or take them to the hospital themselves. But you've done your due diligence. And then you write all of that up and you send it a copy to um, Audrin in the, your case or in our case, we used to sell, uh, send it to Bill Warner. So those things are really important. And we, we again, it's a repeat of some of the things I've already said. And this is my last slide. We all have knowledge. We all have knowledge of the different tasks of what it means to drive. We, um, we can um, look at the dots about, oh, how to do precision turns, how to do um, you know, uh, smooth braking or uh, controlled braking. We know about uh, looking over our, uh, through the back as we back up and that sort of stuff, okay? And, um, and what we need to know is that we need to have experience and that's connecting the dots. And that's where many of you um, who are um, exceptional driver education teachers in the state of Utah need to pass your wisdom and knowledge and your experience on to your fellow driver educators so they too can connect the dots and uh, protect themselves from the liability that they can expose themselves totally un, uh, unaware that they may be doing that. So. That's all I've got. If you get some questions, um, let me know. I am going to send a complete uh, document of what, uh, what is uh, there and uh, what I just did. Um, it won't be in PowerPoint formation. It'll be by uh, Del Freeman and, and Terry Klein and you'll be able to have that. And it has a checklist for your liability portfolio just to have in a file. Um, I'm just gonna send you some kind of electronic um, form that says you completed this training, print it off, put it in your liability form on your portfolio. 
And, and that um, is just another further evidence that you've done your job um, uh, to become a more experienced and effective driver educator. Uh, I think that's really much all, pretty much all I have. Do you have any questions and answers? Put them in, um, put them in chat for me. Oh, yeah, Tracy, awesome, good for you. W O U, go Wolves. And and thank you. Thanks for um, kind of hanging in there. It's been a rough uh, it's a rough month for me, and um, I'm just glad to be able to kind of get back in the saddle and start doing some teaching. So, um, do you have any questions or? Um, answers or questions that that let me stop the share okay do you have any questions for me that that are important to you that i need to answer them and if you do put them in q a and i can answer them after we're gone for the day well you guys are all thanking me i actually have to tell you thanks for uh um just putting up with, uh, well, hi, Wendy. It's good that I was wondering if you were gonna be here. Um, say hi to Mr. Bills for me, if you wouldn't mind. Um, and uh, I just, thanks for um, sticking with me and going through this. It's, it's so important, folks. It's so important that uh, you, you protect yourself. And, and you can't, that's the thing. You can get to a situation where maybe a parent has decided to become litigious and sue you, and you can kind of say, wait, I have all this information. This is where your son is. This is where they were, and this is the evidence of progression, and, um, and it's, it's absolutely amazing. And um, the judge kind of looks at it and goes, I really don't have a case here. You know, case dismissed. Kind of get out of Hi, Gary. Good seeing you. Okay, and uh, you guys are very kind. I really appreciate it. Uh, so, and Clint, thank you very much. I, um, I, will, I will send you uh, the copy of where I got this information. You can start, and I would really, really hope that you would, I mean, I did an amazing job prior to my presentation. She came up with some, really um, just amazing uh, information for you all. And, and I'll tell you what, that's really the start of your liability portfolio. She's given you that. She's told you, okay, this is what we really need to um, be aware of. And, um, and I will tell you, it's a great way to go. So anyway, I am gonna sign off here. I don't see any other, qu well, there's four questions in Q&A and I think those are all taken care of. Uh, I think it's, uh, would you mind emailing me a copy of your police manual you created? I, um, I can probably look to see if I can find some, Tammy, and um, send it your way. Uh, it, uh, it, it's going to be more specific to something that a student of mine did, because I haven't used a policy manual for a while, and I haven't worked with teens for a little bit, but um, I work with teachers and this is so, so important. Um, so yes, I'll try and see what I can do. Okay. If I do, if I can't do that, Tammy, what I will do is I will send you the guidelines for the assignment I do for a policy manual for my students. And then you can go from there. Okay. Any other questions? Sad part is I can't hear you. And I get kind of energized when I hear you, right, Audra? You do the same thing? Yes, it's very difficult to be quiet and you can't see anyone and you can't hear anyone. It's odd you're just speaking to a blank screen. I am. I am. But it's, you know what? It's delightful because I know everything that everybody has said is um, just, just powerful. And it reminds me that what we're saying is a good thing. So yes, I'll email is that. This is definitely the most important session that you guys will ever have. And if you want to watch it again, or if people from your schools didn't catch it, he will be on again on Friday. And I yeah. so much appreciate Rich and his assistance. Thanks, Andre. You're very it's, kind. It's better to hear it from someone else instead of the same person preaching. Well, to you. you have, like, again, you're looking at 20,000 foot level. And these guys are looking down at that, uh, you know, ground level and maybe a little bit above. And, um, and I'm not saying they can't understand a 20,000 foot level. 
I'm just saying that it's so important that we get the full picture of what's required for us as driver educators.